So that my interest in indigenous settler relations has expanded out into uh, the history of race more generally in our area. Uh, I'm focusing, I got a research progress, uh, project that focuses on Victoria, but I think we're learning things about British Columbia and Canada more generally about the history of race. And um, so we're doing two things. One is we're using the new technology of geographic information systems, GIS. Uh, and GIS allows you to uh, attach data to a map and then start to do some of your, um, your test your hypothesis by asking the questions of the map, if you like. So what we've done is taken uh, data about all the people who lived in Victoria in 1871, 81, 91, 1901, and 1911 from the Canada Census. Every 10 years the government would uh, go out and, as they still do, uh, ask people for information about their oh, birthplace, their parents' birthplace, their religion, their income, all kinds of things. And so um, we're able to map everybody to where they lived in Victoria in these five decades. And then we're able to say, okay, uh, where did all the Chinese live? Where did all the First Nations live? Where did the Europeans live? Where did all the Scots live? Or where did all the Presbyterians live? Uh, we're able to kind of, and then the, um, because this is all embedded on a map, the map will turn out red if we ask it to. So, wow, we're able to see new patterns that we couldn't see before. Um, so one of the things we're most interested in is, uh, well, indigenous people and the, uh, the Chinese immig immigrants. And so one of the thoughts that people had about racism in the period, this was a racist period. Uh, this was a period where whites were, when Europeans arrived here, you know, they established a British colony in 1849, uh, and uh, they established, you know, British Columbia Joint Canada in 1871. The only people who had the vote in 1871 were white males who constituted about 10% of the population, uh, you know, so all the First Nations who con constituted about 80% of the population couldn't vote. Women couldn't vote, Asians couldn't vote. And so, uh, you know, they established by decree, if you like, and I think this is one of the interesting questions in my field is how did they pull that off? Uh, they established by decree this hierarchical structure uh, where they were in control. So one of the theories uh, that, that people have had is Chinatown was kind of a place of refuge for the Chinese, that Victoria had as the oldest Chinatown in Canada. Um, and uh, it was, uh, some of my colleagues have written about it as a forbidden city. Whites couldn't go in there, Chinese protective. So GIS kind of opens up the forbidden city for us to have a peek inside and allows us to see that in fact about a third of the people who lived in Chinatown weren't Chinese and um, about a third or a quarter of the Chinese didn't live in Chinatown. And so, it, uh, uh, and so we're coupling this with an investigation of how race was talked about in the newspapers. And uh, again, we expected when we went to the newspapers to find this heavily racist language against the Chinese, for example. And sure, there are some racist language, uh, some denigrating language, um, but way more often we find the Chinese are using the newspaper to advertise their you know, come to Chinatown, buy my rice or buy my china that I'm selling, my, my uh, crockery. Um, come down and gamble. They don't advertise that, but this gambling that the, the whites are... Uh, they come down, they advertise to come down and see our Chinese uh, theater. Uh, and so um, the research has kind of changed my vision of what, how racism operated anyway. It wasn't this kind of uh, harsh, um, brutal... Uh, form of uh, segregation, but rather a kind of, I, I think, more paternalistic um, interactions, daily interactions between the Chinese and the white community. Uh, lots of, if you were rich, you would have a Chinese cook who lived in your house and cooked all your food. You might have some Chinese cleaning staff. Uh, you would probably have Chinese gardeners. So clearly, um, you know, in a sense, that was a status symbol to have these servants working for you. But if you thought so that, that the Chinese were so beyond the pale or so contaminated, you clearly wouldn't have them so close to your living space. So between um, doing some text analysis of how race was talked about and doing this analysis of uh, how race was lived spatially, I think we're coming to new ideas about how race operated. And, and I, I think uh, you know, today we're still concerned about racism in British Columbia and Canada. Racism is still here, but it operates at a much different level uh, and I would say much less obvious and much less, uh, has less effect on people's lives than it did then. 
So what we're trying to understand in a way is how racism goes away. Like how do you, how do you undo racism? Um, and so that's partly what this project is about.